for joining us on this Mother's Day. And I want to wish a happy Mother's Day to all the moms out there. Uh, we get the chance once again to worship together today. Uh, before we begin, though, I just want to make one major announcement. Next week on the 17th, next week on the 17th, we will be meeting back in the gym uh, for regular services. Uh, the time, though, is still to be announced. You need to tune in. Uh, Midweek, we'll have it out. We'll blast it, and we'll blast it over Facebook, and we'll blast it uh, over our, our website. Uh, just to, when we decide on times, we may be having two services. We may be having one service. We'll let you know on that. Uh, but I do know this. Next Sunday, there will not be child care. Uh, the children will have to sit at tables with their, their families um, as all of you know, kids don't do social distancing real well. So it's a little tough to ask them to do that. So we're going to continue to um, spread out tables, social distance, stay as safe as possible. But worship again together in the gymnasium next week. And I can't tell you how excited I am for that. So thank you again for tuning in with us this morning. And I hope you'll join us now uh, just in, in a time of worship through song and, and through prayer and then as Pastor Paul brings the message. So, Father, we love you, and we thank you so much for today. And Lord, we look forward to what you have for us as we meet with you, as we lift up your name, as we worship you, Lord, as we sing to you. We bless you, Lord. In your mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Before we start singing, I just want to tell every mom out there, Happy Mother's Day. Especially to my mom. Happy Mother's Day. My wife, happy Mother's Day. Hope you guys have a wonderful day. And let's worship the Lord this morning.
glad you've joined us this morning, and I hope you have your Bible with you, and I hope you'll turn with me to the book of John, the Gospel of John, chapter 7. John chapter 7. We're continuing our series this morning about overcoming personal bondages. Every one of us have personal bondages, areas of entrenchment, areas of strongholds in our life, and the Lord wants us to walk in freedom from those. Last week, we talked about the bondage of fear and anxiety. And this morning, we're going to be looking at one that's closely related, and that is the bondage of self-condemnation. So I want you to look with me at a situation that took place in John chapter 7, uh, beginning with verse 53 and going through verse 11 of chapter 8. Everyone went to his home, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning, he came again into the temple, and all the people were coming to him, and he sat down and began to teach them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery, and having set her in the center of the court, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in adultery in the very act. Now in the law of Moses commanded us to stone such women. What then do you say? They were saying this, testing him, so that they may have grounds for accusing him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground. But when they persisted in asking him, he straightened up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. When they heard it, they began to go out one by one, beginning with the older ones, and he was left alone. And the woman where she was, in the center of the court. Straightening up, Jesus said to her, Woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, I do not condemn you either. Go, from now on, sin no more. Well, Father, as we come to you this morning, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that your word is true. We thank you that it's trustworthy. We thank you, Lord, that it is transforming. And, Father, we pray that we would hear what you have to say to us this morning, that, Lord, your Holy Spirit would speak to us, Lord, because this is an area that I don't know that there's any of us that don't face this, this battle with self-condemnation. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask that you would just give us understanding and enlightenment and help us, Lord, to walk in your truth. And we pray this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let me ask you this question. 
Do you ever beat yourself up when you fail or you sin? Do you find it sometimes that you take days or weeks or months to forgive yourself? Maybe, maybe it's been years. Maybe you ask God to forgive you over and over and over. You keep doing that, not really believing that he has or feeling like he hasn't. Or maybe you try to make deals with God and, and just beg him to forgive you. Or you put pressure on yourself to perform. You're constantly inspecting yourself or analyzing yourself. You see, these are the tactics of the enemy. And if Satan can keep you stuck in condemnation, he will keep you joyless, he will keep you peaceless and powerless. And what happens is he wants to keep us sin-focused. If Satan can keep you sin-focused rather than Jesus-focused, he's going to keep you in a cycle of sin, confess, repeat. And Jesus wants us to walk, walk in freedom from that. You see, Satan wants you to be overly introspective. He wants you to be defeated. And really it leads to a legalism. Now, we often hear the term today, greasy grace. That's something to be concerned with, I suppose. Although to me, grace isn't greasy. Real grace is biblical. License is greasy. But the other opposite is true as well, and that's legalism. And in my experience, I'm just as concerned about life-killing law than I, as, as I am greasy grace. And so when we look at the scripture this morning, we see in this passage uh, a situation in which Jesus is at the Feast of Tabernacles. He's, at the, he's in Jerusalem. He's at the temple. He's at the Feast of Tabernacles, or what's called the Feast of Tents or Booths. And he's there teaching the people. And the Pharisees, who are always trying to trap him, and never, never successful. Bring a woman caught in adultery. Caught, as they said, in the very act. Now what's interesting about this passage is that when they bring her, it's obvious they're not really concerned about the law. Because if they'd have been concerned about the law, they'd have brought the man as well. They were concerned with trying to trip up Jesus. And so they bring this woman to Jesus, and as they put her before him, they say, Jesus, our law, Moses' law, says that this woman, caught in the very act of adultery, should be stoned. What do you say? Well, that's a trapping question. That's all they're doing is they're trying to bait him. And so he's, Jesus never took the bait, and he never took the bait any of the times the Pharisees tried. And in this, he looks, he knows that, well, he, he's got one of two things that most people would say. Of course, they, they don't realize they're dealing with the son of the living God. But he could say, well, stoner. And then they would say, aha, you know, so much for your grace. Or he could say, let her go. And they would say, see, he dishonors the law. That's what they were hoping he would say, one of those two things. But Jesus looks at them, and the Bible tells us that he stooped down and he began to move his finger around in the dirt, maybe writing something. I had one professor in seminary said that maybe he was writing down the names of the Pharisees' mistresses or girlfriends. We don't know what he was writing. But if you think about where he was, there might be an indication to what he was saying to them, although I don't know that they caught it. Because the Bible says in that passage that he was writing in the dust. But remember where he was. He wasn't out in the streets or the villages. He was in the temple. So he was literally moving his finger through the dust on the stone of the temple. Could it be that Jesus was doing that as an indication that he was the very one who wrote the law they were bringing to him? Because he, in, with Moses, had given him the Ten Commandments by what? Writing with his finger on the stone. I think it's very possible that Jesus was indicating to the Pharisees, guys, I am the I am. I'm the one who wrote the law. And so as he's doing that, he looks up and he says, he of you who's never sinned, you be the one to throw the first rock. Can you imagine their faces? Can you imagine them thinking to themselves and then looking at each other and then finally realizing, wow, 
uh, we can't do this. I can't do this. So they one by one drop their rocks and they walk away, once again defeated by the master of all answers because he is the master. Jesus goes over to the woman. No doubt she's huddled up, afraid she's getting ready to get hit with rocks. And he asks her a question, woman, where are your accusers? And of course they had left. And then he says these words. He says, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Now, both of those phrases are vital. If we're going to live a balanced Christian life, we've got to understand both of those phrases. The first phrase, he says, neither do I condemn you. Why? Because Jesus said himself in John 3, he did not come to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Now, the Holy Spirit comes to convict, but Jesus never comes to beat up. In fact, the folks that Jesus was the roughest on were the religious The folks that he had the strongest words for were those who thought they were high and mighty. The sinners loved him. They flocked around him because he he was different. He preached truth in grace. And we know because John said he was a man of truth and grace. And he told this woman, I don't condemn you. And then he said, go and sin no more. And his essence was, be free. You see, to not be under condemnation doesn't mean you live any way you want to. Because with great forgiveness and great freedom comes great responsibility. But as I want us to look at this morning, many times we get caught in the trap of thinking we must perform to keep ourselves not condemned. And that's not the gospel at all. In fact, when you look at the book of Galatians, Paul confronts a false gospel, and he, he says that that is a curse, that is anathema. We have to be careful that we don't somehow distort the gospel. Even through our self-effort, we can do that. And I found that in, in America, especially, Christianity, we have humanized it so much that Christianity, as we have kind of remade it, and trying to remake it in our image, we have spoken or preached a a Christianity that is less gospel and more performance. And what that does is it puts people right back into bondage that Jesus freed them from. It puts us into bondage. And you may find that you're there yourself this morning. I want you to look at one other verse that I think is vital. In Romans chapter 8, based on this story, Jesus says, or through Paul, therefore, There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The therefore points us back to the previous chapters that teach us how we are free in Christ through what Jesus did. And he says there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, let's think about that word no for a moment. The word no means no. It indicates none. If we go to Burger King and order a Whopper with cheese, and they say, we have no cheese, then it would be foolish for us to say, well, then I'll just take the rest of the cheese you've got. Well, I just told you I have no cheese. Yeah, I know, but I want the rest. Whatever you got left, just put it on the burger. Well, none of us would say that. doesn't make any sense. If you pull up to a gas station, and there are signs on the pumps that say, we have no gas, you don't ask the gas station owner for the rest of the gas. There is no gas. No means no. So when Paul says there is no condemnation, it doesn't mean there's a little bit. It doesn't mean there's some over here. It means there's none. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because they're in Christ Jesus. So what are some signs of self-condemnation? What are some things that we can see in our life and in the lives of others that show that we're walking not in freedom, but in self-condemnation. Well, let me give you a couple of things. Number one, not forgiving yourself for past failures. Number two, beating yourself up over current struggles. You can walk in guilt over the past. You can walk in uh, just beating yourself up over current struggles. I've heard it said that for some Christians, their favorite hymn is not breathe on me, it's beat on me. And they beat on themselves all the time, and that is not God's will for you. There's another sign, or a couple of other signs of self-condemnation. 
And that is constantly examining yourself. Obsessive introspection. And what we're talking about here is not the ministry of the Holy Spirit where He speaks to your heart, He prompts you, He convicts you. Yes, that, that is His ministry. That's part of His ministry to us. And He will do that, thankfully. But you and I can get stuck in the rut of overanalyzing everything about ourselves and rather than enjoying the freedom that we have in Christ, we are constantly inspecting ourselves and I've heard it called, and I call it ingrown eyeballitis. It's where we turn our eyes inside and we're always looking at us. Well, guess what? If you're always looking at you, you're never looking at Him. And the Lord doesn't call us to constantly look at ourselves. In fact, that will plunge you into a cycle of defeat. But you, do, you are to look at Him. I am to look at Him. And we're to say, Lord, hey, search my heart. Show me anywhere, anything, as the Scripture says. Show me anything in my life that's un inconsistent with you. And let Him do that. But you don't have to walk around trying to find it. The Holy Spirit is really good at His job. And He can do it. But many of us allow the enemy to draw us into that cycle of defeat where we're constantly looking at ourselves. Another sign is the constant comparison of yourself to someone else. If you're walking around and saying, well, I'm just not as good of a Christian as she is. Or, boy, I can't do things like he can. Or I, I have a different personality. Maybe I ought to be more like him. Or maybe I ought to act more like that. No, not at all. That will also plunge you into a perfectionism that you can't meet. It'll plunge you into condemning yourself because you don't think you're as good as someone else. And then it will lead to another sign of self-condemnation, and that is you're not being yourself. You're spending so much time trying to be like somebody else, you're not enjoying the, G the you that Jesus created you to be. Now think about this. The Lord told us to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. But He also told us to love our neighbor, how? As ourself. And we think, well, wait a minute, how am I to love myself? That sounds kind of selfish. That sounds like the very opposite of what I should be doing. But what Jesus is talking about there is that we are to love ourselves as He loves us. That is, you are loving Christ in you. The hope of glory, Paul says in Colossians. So, be yourself. Now, let me give you very quickly, and if you take notes, I'm going to work through this very quickly for the sake of time, but I want to give you... Ten things you need to know. I know ten's a, that's a big list, but I want you to jot these ten things down because they'll be very helpful to you. Ten quick things you need to know to walk in truth and not in self-condemnation. Number one, you need to know that you are uniquely made by God. He formed you specially. He created you. Just to be you. So number one, you are uniquely made by God. Number two, you are human and not perfect. You are human and not perfect. Now that is not an excuse to go do whatever we want to do. That's not an excuse for sin. All right, We can't use it that way. That's not, that's not right because Christ lives in us. But the reality is you are human and not perfect. And your heavenly Father understands it. Now he calls us to a holy life. But he doesn't expect you to do it on your own. He doesn't expect you to do it in your own self-effort or your own power. Because he knows that we are dust. He knows how we are. He formed us. He created us. Number three, the Lord is your only standard. The Lord is your only standard. When you look around, you don't have to compare yourself with anybody else. You don't have to try to be like anybody else. Now, there are things that we can glean from others. I, I have people all around me. I say, boy, I really like that about them. I really like that. Or I have mentors and heroes of the faith. And you can see something, a, a trait in someone that you say, wow, I really like that about Mike. I really appreciate that about Fran. You can think, wow, those are great things. I really want to develop that in my life. That's fine. But you are you. And you are to be the unique you that God calls you to be. And He is your standard. He is your audience. All right, number four. This took me a long time to realize this, and it took me even longer to come to peace with. But the fact is, is not everybody in this world is going to like you. <laughs> not everybody is going to like you. Not everybody is going to approve of you. 
And if you're like me, I spent many years trying to gain the approval of everyone around me. And so in high school, I kind of became the class comedian because I wanted everybody to like me. If I could make you laugh, I felt like you liked me. The problem is I became perform, a performer rather than just being me. Now, what happens many times is that we feel like we have to gain the approval of folks around us and, and maybe we compromise ourselves in doing that. The, the, the reality is, is that not everybody is going to like you or approve of you, and that's okay. Because, again, you and I live for an audience of one. It doesn't, mind, it doesn't mean that we walk around with some type of attitude that says, I don't care if you don't like me. Of course we care, but I'm not going to be dominated by it. I'm not going to determine my life based on it. I want to say, hey, the bottom line is, does God approve? Does God approve? Is what you're doing Christ-like? Yeah, ask those questions. But you got to understand that you're not going to be able to gain everybody's approval in this world. I mean, think of it. Jesus couldn't get the approval of everybody. How on earth would we? Well, here's a fifth thing, and it's very important to understand. When you and I got saved, Jesus completely forgave us of all of our sins. That's what the Bible tells us. That he completely forgave us. When he said, it is finished, that means that he did everything he needed to do for you and I to be forgiven. The Bible has countless verses talking about how he's thrown our sin as far as the east is from the west. In Hebrews 10, it says that we have been perfected in Christ. That perfection is not in our, our actions. We know that by daily living. But it's in our standing. We've been perfected in our standing before God because there's nothing left to be judged. There's no, no condemnation. That's why Paul said there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Why? Because Jesus took the condemnation for you. He took the penalty for your sin. He took the wrath of God. He became sin who knew no sin that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. What powerful truth is that? So what condemnation is there? Live out of what he's done for you, not out of what you try to do. You'll never experience healing until you embrace your forgiveness. Never. You'll never experience healing in your soul, healing in your emotions. You'll never truly experience, I don't believe, a transformed mind until that foundational issue is settled that you are forgiven. Past, present, future sins are under the blood of Jesus. And so many people say, well, but preacher, if you teach that, or pastor, if you say that, people are going to go out and, and sin. You're giving them a license to sin. And I say, you know what? I think folks are sinning pretty well today without a license. <laughs> I think they're doing a pretty good job of that. But I think here's what happens. When I realize that I'm forgiven completely and totally, it doesn't make me want to run out and sin and say, oh boy, now I'm forgiven. I can do whatever I want to. No. It so overwhelms me that God would be that gracious and that loving that I don't want to sin. I want to live to please Him. I want to live to honor Him. I know I can't do it in my own strength. That's why He gave us the Holy Spirit. But that's what I want to do. I want to say, Holy Spirit, live through me. Do what you want to do. So there is no condemnation. And you will never embrace your forgiveness until you believe that the Heavenly Father truly loves you. And I believe that's at the core of it. I believe that is the core of self-condemnation, perfectionism, um, an over-analytical mind, an introspection, and all that. It's the fear that God really doesn't love me. That's at the, that's at the heart of it. And you and I will never walk in freedom, we'll never walk in the abundant life of Jesus Christ and our forgiveness if we don't understand how much the Father loves you. See, when you ask Jesus to cleanse you of your sin, and this is a sixth thing you need to know, by the way. When you ask Jesus to cleanse you of your sin, He immediately restores fellowship. Aren't you glad that God does not put you on probation? He does not say, well, let's see how you do over the next week. or I'm going to give you 30 days to shape up. No, there's no sin left to punish. There's no wrath left for him to deal out because he's forgiven you. 
Now, he may discipline us. He may discipline us for our sin, but he does that out of love. And understand the difference between discipline and punishment. The difference is that, it's well, it's the difference between retribution and restoration. Discipline is always for the purpose of restoration. Discipline, or I'm sorry, punishment is for retribution. God doesn't punish his children. Jesus looked at that woman and said, neither I can, do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. No, his purpose was not retribution. It was restoration. Jesus said himself, I did not come to condemn the world, but that the world through me might be saved. Now listen, don't miss this. There is coming a time when the wrath of God will fall on this planet. There is coming a time where every person will have to give an account of their life. And if you're not under the blood, you are under the wrath of God. But you have the choice this morning to be forgiven. You have the choice to be changed. All right, let me give you a seventh thing. When you don't forgive yourself, you elevate yourself above the Father. When you don't forgive yourself, you're in essence saying, I'm more holy than Almighty God. Because God the Father has said you're forgiven. And for you to say, no, I'm not, or I'm not as much as you think, is to disagree with the Father. Here's an eighth thing. Anytime self-condemnation enters your mind, you are under attack by the demonic. That's just a fact. Because once you've... Now, the Holy Spirit may convict you of a sin, and He does that in order to restore you and restore that fellowship and cleanse you. And so you come to Him, and you don't have to beg Him. You don't have to beg the Lord to forgive you because He's already forgiven you. You come and you say, Lord, 1 John 1, 9, I confess. I agree. That was wrong. And he's faithful and just to forgive you. But the fact of the matter is, after you have confessed that and the Lord has forgiven you, any future thoughts concerning that sin of self-condemnation, that is a pure attack by, a, by the demons. That's what it is. It's straight from the pit of hell. So you need to recognize that. And you need to say, no, I'm forgiven. I'm under the blood. I've confessed that. And you don't have to walk in that condemnation. Number nine. When you are constantly looking at yourself, you are being distracted from Him. And that's what we need to do. We need to look at Him. And then let me give you number 10. God's will is for you to walk out of your self-incarceration right now. God's will is for you to walk out of your self-incarceration because that's what self-condemnation is. You're putting yourself in a prison. And God's will is for you to walk out right now. The door to your prison, if you've accepted Christ as your Savior and Lord, the door to your prison has been swung open and you are forgiven. But will you walk out today? Will you believe God? And will you walk out? So here's what I would encourage you to do this morning <clears throat> as we close. To embrace your forgiveness. First of all, you've got to make a choice to believe it. It's a choice. It's not a feeling. You can't say, well, I'll wait till I feel that. <clears throat> if you wait till you feel it, you'll never feel it. If you choose it, the feelings will come. Now, they may not come right away because Satan's going to war against you. He's had you in that cell for a long time. He doesn't want you coming out. He doesn't even care if you know the door is open as long as you don't come out. But you and I have to make a choice to say, you know what, Lord, I'm going to believe you over my feelings. I'm going to believe your word over my own thoughts. And so you choose to believe it. And then you say it. I'm a big proponent of this. Say it out loud. Maybe it's just you in the car. Maybe it's just you in the shower. Maybe it's just you by yourself. But say it out loud. I'm forgiven. There's no condemnation for Paul Cruz. There's no condemnation for Aaron Hall. There's no condemnation for Frank Bradley. There's no condemnation. For those of us who are in Christ. None. Not even a little bit. There's none. Say it. Say it and say it and say it and hear it and hear it and hear it. Because like I said last week, you need to hear it. It encourages you and it terrifies hell.
And then thank him for it. Lord, thank you. Wow, I don't deserve it. I sure didn't do anything to get it. But I thank you that it's true. And then remind yourself of it every day. Every day. Preach the gospel to lost people, yes. But preach it to yourself. So we're going to close in prayer. And if you've never been saved, I trust this morning that maybe you realize your need for Jesus because He looks at you the same way <clears throat> He looked at that woman. He wants you to come to Him. And if you've already come to Him, walk in your freedom today. You're forgiven. That doesn't make you want to do more sin. It makes you want to walk closer with Him. So, Father, we thank You, Lord, for this time. We thank You for Your Word. We thank You for the truth that for those of us who are in Christ, there is no condemnation. And, Lord, we're free. We're forgiven. And You've given us Your Holy Spirit. You've come into us. And you want to live through us. And Father, we just want to surrender to you today. We want to surrender to your truth and believe what you say. We want to surrender to your life and have you live through us. And Lord, if there's anyone that's listening today that doesn't know Jesus, I pray that right now they'll just confess their sin, they'll ask you to forgive them, and they'll put their faith and trust in you as Lord and Savior. And Lord, I pray they'll let us know through Facebook or an email, call the church office. Lord, we'd love to know of their decision to follow you. For Lord, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.